Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship with Mona Avenue Christian Church. Welcome to a time of wonder and worship and good news and gospel. So, nothing big coming up soon, right? Nothing this week. It's going to be a quiet week, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> Might as well get out of the way, right? Two days, ah, two days, and then we'll find out what's going on. Okay, well, so then two weeks from today, we'll do um, a special type of sermon where I'll, I will present the paper that I'm going to give in, at the Society of Biblical Literature Conference. I uh, found out that I'm going to be presenting on Saturday morning of the conference, which I just realized driving over here, there may not be a ton of people there because the thing starts Friday night, but really it gets rolling Saturday, and I'm like, it's the first session Saturday morning, so I don't know, I have no idea how many people will show up to that session. I have, uh, I was going through the schedule, figuring out what papers I want to go here. Um, so, looking forward to that. Um, let's see, we will be taking communion, as usual, so if you have something to eat, something to drink, we'll share together that later in the service, and uh, now invite us to sing together the Lord's Prayer. As we come to our time of prayer today, um, I just put one item in my notes. Um, but before I get to that, I did see this morning, uh, just this morning in the news, that um, Israel um, conducted a ground incursion into Syria for the first time. And so we really need to be praying for the situation over there um, because Israel now is has devastated Gaza, has had a ground invasion into Lebanon, and now has, incur has this incursion into Syria. Um, it, so I need to pray that uh, God grabs Bibi by the neck and gets him straight and get him doing what he needs to do. I, no, I didn't see it. it they, they captured a Syrian citizen was the one thing I heard out of it. They made this incursion. They captured one Syrian citizen, but I, that's about all I heard. Um, now, the one item I have on my list here, probably no big surprise, is uh, Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday is the end of election season. Thank God, yes. <laughs> I, I agree. Get this over with. Um, yeah, so I was thinking about, you know, the election. Uh, uh, I'll be working polling station in our, over in Upland, um, assistant supervisor, so I can make sure that at least one place runs smoothly. 
Um, but <laughs> but it, yeah, I, I imagine it will. I, I was, you know, I'm encouraged when I go to the trainings and see how a lot of these folks really know what they're doing. They've been doing this for a long time. So, um, yeah. And uh, I, don't, I don't think I mentioned this. When I went to the supervisor training, there was, there was one guy there who I, I, I kind of pegged as a little potentially Trumpy kind of, or he, he seemed to have a very skeptical eye at a lot of what was going on. And it was interesting to watch his reactions to things as they went through some of the procedures and all. I could see his attitude kind of shift so that by the end of the training, he seemed, I, I think it had kind of convinced him that this is actually a pretty well-run system. And um, I remember one, one part that really seemed to strike him was when they were talking about making sure nobody ever has more than one ballot, right? Because sometimes they bring it in, they've marked it up, and they want a new ballot because they you know, wrote all over it or something. But they have to surrender it first, and they can't get a new ballot. Until, and they, they're like, well, how can I copy over? And so, well, you can't have both. So you could take a picture, you can, you know, we'll give you some paper and a pencil, you can write down, you can do, you know, whatever, but you can't have, all right, we can't give you the ballot until you give us that one. So, and he, you know, I, I could see like, oh, okay. So, things like that, but, um, yeah. So I, I was thinking about um, the election coming up, though, and I was thinking, okay, what to be praying for? So some things I came up with were, may everyone vote who should vote. And, and, and that also includes, may everyone make, be able to vote. Um, and that the people will not be kept from voting. Uh, may the races turn out in the wisest way possible. And I mean that all up and down the ballot. May we have peace and patience as we await the results. Peace and patience as we await the results because, you know, there's a fair chance we won't know on Tuesday night all of what's happening. It might take a day or two. Hopefully it'll be clear enough, but it might take a little while. Uh, may there not be any violence during or after the voting. Um, and then a couple of final reminders. May we remember that we serve God, that Yahweh is God, and Jesus is president, which is more or less what Jesus is Lord would have sounded like back in um, the Roman Empire. Saying Jesus is Lord would have sounded like us saying Jesus is president. So um, our true president is Jesus. The earthly ones are, are here for a while. It's a temp job, as uh, Dave put it, right, in the movie, movie Dave. Have you ever seen that? It's, it's a funny movie. It's, uh, what is it, Kevin Costner? Or is that, I forget. Basically, the president falls ill, and they get this guy who does impressions of the president because he looks strikingly like him, and they, they like make him like stand in and pretend to be the president for a while until he, until he comes out of his coma or whatever. And but at one point, he says, you know, something about, you know, this is just a temp job. But, um, yeah. What other prayers? We have either uh, for ourselves, for the country, the election, the world. Thank you all so much. So enormous. And I love you all. Giving thanks and praise God for making it through last year and all the prayers and support. And uh, this being one year anniversary from the surgery, which um, that was rough. And it was a rough go coming back from that. And so she's asking for prayers to. Uh, complete that healing. <coughs> okay, so so Chris asking prayers for mm -hmm. um, some ongoing pain and effects from having COVID, and hopefully it's the things that'll resolve themselves. Um, yeah, so I'm praying for that. Right, well, let's let's go to God. God, we, we do give you praise and thank you for the ways that you are with us, 
the ways that you bring healing into our lives, the wholeness, community, sense of support and comfort. And God, we call on all that and more for the next couple of days as we approach the end of the election season here. And Tuesday, the final votes come in, and then the tallying begins. And God, we are anxious. Many of us are anxious about the results um, for president, for the Senate, for the House of Representatives especially, but even for local races, local measures. How we pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, we pray that you have been working, that your people have been working behind the scenes and shaping this whole season so that the outcome will be the one that you approve. We know, God, that the president or our senator and nobody else is our savior but you, but that you do use the levers of government for your purposes, that you call for leaders to promote justice, to lift up the broken and the poor, to bind up the, the hurting, the traumatized, the injured. You call on your leaders to live out public love, that our institutions and our government and all would be shaped by love. God, that is what we ask. Help us not to fall into fear. Regardless of how things turn out, God, help us to keep our hope in you, to rejoice with those who rejoice to weep with those who weep, to search for your peace that passes understanding. God, may that peace be with us, especially in the next few days, but always, really. And we ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Today's scripture reading is Luke 22, 24 through 27. An argument broke out among the disciples over which one of them should be regarded as the greatest. But Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles rule over their subjects, and those in authority over them are called friends of the people. But that's not the way it will be with you. Instead, the greatest among you must become like a person of lower status and the leader like a servant. So which one is greater, the one who is seated at the table or the one who serves at the table? Isn't it the one who is seated at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Uh, so the disciples um, were arguing about which one of them was the greatest. Um, and if you know anything about Jesus, you know that went over really well. Not. <laughs> Uh, so this is the last Sunday of this series that I've been preaching on uh, governance and leadership because the election season is coming down to an end. Uh, we just got a couple more days. And so now I got this short passage about leaders as servants. <clears throat> the disciples are arguing about who's the greatest, and Jesus basically says, cut it out. It says, the kings, the rulers of the Gentiles rule over their subjects. They are on top of them. And those in authority are called friends of the people, right? Benefactors. I looked into this term. Um, apparently, princes and honored persons were often referred to as benefactors or friends of the people, something like that. Um, focusing on their civic contributions. 
And I, um, and the point, part of the point that Jesus is making here is that they're rulers. They are ruling and often oppressively ruling, and yet they're called benefactors, philanthropists, um, good people. And, and isn't this how we often see it, right? The people in power, uh, I'd say probably in our society, it's people with a lot of wealth. They're seen as these great benefactors because they give so much to society. But what they give is a, you know, out of a, an enormous abundance. They give some, which to us looks like a lot because they have way more. Jesus said, this is not how it's going to be with you, but not so for you. The rule for you all is a reversal of the roles, a reversal of expectations. And this is a theme for Jesus, right? The first will be last, the last will be first. He's constantly upending things. And he ends it with this really interesting observation. He says, who is greater, the one serving at the table or the one being served. And he says, it basically says, obviously it's the one being served, right? Um, and that is, I mean, I think we would agree. You know, usually it's, you know, the, the important person is the one being served, right? And then Jesus says, but I am among you as one who serves. I am among you as one who serves. So obviously the greatest one is the one being served, and yet I am serving, dot, dot, dot. Draw the conclusion there, right? Jesus is the one who serves. <laughs> well, this got me thinking about humility and what it means uh, to be humble, because Jesus says that the, the one who is greatest among you must become like a person of lower status, and the leader like a servant. And so my mind went to humility, and, it, and maybe partly because it's come up in this presidential race. Um, back on September 17th, Sarah Huckabee Sanders was in Flint, Michigan um, at a rally, and she said, uh, I'm just going to read the quote here. She said, quote, you can walk into a room like this where people cheer, where you step onto the stage, and you might think for a second that you're kind of special. Then you go home, and your kids remind you very quickly you're not that big of a deal. Now, I think if the quote had stopped there, that was, that's a pretty good observation. It's like, it's, 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 um, it's kind of natural when you're, you know, you're being celebrated, you're being up there, and people cheer when you talk, and so on. It, it's like, yeah, you can get kind of full of yourself, and it is helpful to have people to kind of remind you that you are human. Um, but she didn't stop there. She kept going. She says, so my kids keep me humble. Unfortunately, Kamala Harris doesn't have anything keeping her humble. That was Sarah Huckabee Sanders. A couple weeks later on the uh, Call Her Daddy podcast, Kamala Harris went on this podcast. I listened to the interview. It was, it was decent. Pretty good interview. Uh, but this was on October 6th, and she was asked about this, about this thing that uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders had said, and, and this is her part of her response. Kamala Harris said, quote, I don't think she understands that there are a whole lot of women out here who, one, are not aspiring to be humble. Two, a whole lot of women out here who have a lot of love in their lives, uh, family in their life, and children in their life. And I think it's really important for women to lift each other up. And she went on and said a little more, but I think that um, you get the gist of it there. And th this struck me, and I, and I had this feeling that some people were going to react badly to that comment about 
some women are not aspiring to be humble, and I, w I wasn't disappointed. You know, people, oh, oh, not, oh, oh, don't, shouldn't we be, strive to be humble? <clears throat> well, so I thought, okay, well, let me think about humility. Um, in the Greek, the word usually translated um, humility is um, tapenos, which means like to be subservient. Right? It's the unpretentious. It's kind of the opposite of a. Um, uh, I said is a opposite of a free person's demeanor. It's like unpretentious. So that seems to kind of fit with that idea that you know hum being humble is kind of putting yourself in that place of a servant. And then I turn to one of the most probably famous passages that use that are is usually are often translated with the word humble, and that's Micah 6.8. Um, he has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you to do justice, to love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. It's usually how it's translated. To do justice, to love chesed, which is this covenant committed love, and to walk, get this right, to walk tzana with your God. That's the Hebrew. Um, the word is tr traditionally translated humble, but there seems to be a lot of evidence that it should probably be translated more something like carefully or um, wisely, cautiously. So do justice, love committed love, and walk carefully, walk cautiously with your God, to walk carefully. The call for humility um, is an interesting one, I, and it's, it's, it's also particularly interesting for somebody who has the power that Sarah Huckabee Sanders does, and the uh, name recognition and the, and the fame to uh, call on somebody else to be humble. It's an interesting choice. And we often see this, that people, when they call for humility, what they want is for people to sit down. Um, when I look at the New Testament and the Gospels in particular, Jesus spoke out against pride. He, he did. He wanted some people to humble themselves. But the people that he addressed that to were almost exclusively leaders, religious leaders, government leaders, mostly religious leaders. He called out their hypocrisy. True humility. I'll get to that. It feels to me, as I look through the scriptures, that the way it talks about pride and the way it talks about humility is addressed at the prideful. It's addressed at the powerful. It's addressed to those who need some humility. So the powerful. Humility is for the powerful. True humility. Seeing yourself as you are. No more, no less. Oh. Remembering a, a, this passage in Paul's letters, I'm... I just thought of it. I can't remember where it is, but he says something about not seeing yourself, not um, thinking of yourself more highly than you ought. But I think a corollary to that could be not looking at yourself more lowly than you ought. You see, for the powerless, to call on the powerless to exhibit humility is to tell them to stay in their place. To tell the powerless to be humble means to sit down, shut up, and let us get things done the way we want to. It's not a very humble thing to say. For the powerless, humility could be seeing the power that one does have and using it well. So maybe humility for the powerless is seeing themselves seeing in themselves the power that they do have 
and using it for others. Do we want a leader who's humble? If so, who is that? I mean, I look at the presidential race, well, we got one candidate who says she's not aspiring to be humble, and the other, by actions and words, seems to be not aspiring to that either. So, do we want a leader who is weak and easily manipulated? Do you want a leader who's not powerful? Do you want a leader who is strong to the point of being insulting, overbearing, and oppressive? Do we want a public servant who takes the word servant seriously? There are people in government who actually talk about it as public service. They don't always live it that way, even if they say that. But I like the idea behind it. The idea behind it sounds like it resonates with this passage. Jesus saying, those who want to be the greatest among you should serve others. Serving others doesn't necessarily mean putting yourself down, being a worm. It means serving, using what talents, what privileges, what power you have to serve others. The greatest among you must become like a person who serves. The leader is like a servant. A good leader serves others, not themselves. Serves the least of these, not the most. There's a song by the uh, artist Semler. I think I've quoted this before, but I'm, it's, it's so good I'm going to quote it again. The um, song is, uh, Be Like Jesus. And then the chorus says, I want to be like Jesus. I don't want to be like them. I want to look out for who needs me and hang out with my 12 best friends. And I love that a couple different levels, but that I want to look out for who needs me. That line is really stuck with me. The idea that we look out for who needs me. Who needs what I have to offer? Who needs what I have to give? Who needs the gifts that I have? Who needs the power that I have? Or who, de who needs the benefits of things I can do with what power I do have? I think it's a question for all of us, not just for our leaders, but for all of us. How do we best use what we have to serve others? Who will look out for those who are in need? A servant leader. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this word. We pray that you will lead us to be servants of others with what abilities and talents and gifts and power and privilege we have to help others, to watch for those in need, and to put into leadership people who have that same kind of mentality, who will look out for the good of others and use what power they have to serve. In Jesus' name, the servant, we pray. Amen. As we prepare ourselves to come to Christ's table, invite us to sing together, Come and Find the Quiet Center. I, I picked this one, well, Wes sent, sends me options, but I picked this one partly because I think we need it right now, especially in the next few days. Come and find 
the quiet center. Welcome to Christ's table. It is here we come to meet our crucified and risen Lord in tangible, physical ways through bread and cup. And on that night so long ago, Jesus took bread and he gave thanks. Baruch Adonai Haolam. Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, the creator who brings forth bread from the earth. And he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this to remember me. And then he took a cup, and again he gave thanks. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam. Borei hagaf, and blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, the creator of the fruit of the vine. And he gave it to them, saying, Drink, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. And I tell you the truth, I won't drink again of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. body of Christ broken for us. The blood of Christ shed for us. Thanks be to God for the gifts of God for the people of God. today is one spirit of love and um, just looking at the song again this morning I realized I, I didn't uh, maybe I didn't know this this before but the song is by uh, Paul B. Svensson who um, lives in this Southern California or had, did at least um, 
he played at a lot of camps that I counseled, uh, youth camps back in the day. And uh, he's done a lot of good music. I didn't know he'd, I didn't realize he'd written this one. Um, and uh, before the service, I was playing a recording of it. It was by uh, Josh Elson and uh, Andrew Moran, who um, Josh Elson also uh, was at a lot of the camps that I counseled um, years ago. And uh, Andrew, I know, is very, still very involved in disciples' uh, circles with music. So it's a very disciples' song and a good one. So I was really pleased to see that. we go. May God be above us to watch over and protect us. May God be beneath us to lift us up and raise us from the dust. May God be ahead of us to lead us and guide us in just ways. May God be behind us to push us away from the wrong paths. May God be beside us to walk with us and comfort us. May God be within us to love us forever and guide us always. Amen. some basic knowledge. That's, that's the one thing with 
I know a lot of people are like, oh, we need to teach the Bible in school, and what they mean by that is disturbing. Um, but I think some basic literacy, like just kind of some basic, would it does make some sense, actually. Um, just kind of a Bible as literature, even just a... Uh, even just to catch, you know, popular cultural references and things. There's so much of that. 